Enterprise Campus Design. As discussed in the previous video, the Enterprise Campus Functional Area is divided into the following modules. So first, you've got the Campus Infrastructure. This module includes three layers. Okay, So you've got the Building Access Layer, the Distribution Layer, and the Campus Core Layer. Now, you also have the Server Farm, Edge Distribution, which is optional. Okay, so this section discusses the design of each of the layers and modules within the Enterprise Campus and identifies best practices related to the design of each. Let's start with the relative considerations for the campus design. Okay, or the Enterprise Campus requirements. Now, as shown here in the table, so each enterprise campus module has different requirements. Okay, so for example, this table illustrates how modules located closer to user require a higher degree of scalability so that the campus network can be expanded in the future without redesigning the complete network. So for example, adding new workstations to a network should result in a neither high investment cost nor performance degradation. So you've got end users in the building access layer usually do not require high performance or high availability, but these features are crucial to the campus core layer and the server farm module. Now for the price, okay. The price per port increases with increased performance and availability. Now for the campus and core, okay, so it requires a guarantee of higher throughput so that they can handle all traffic flows and not introduce additional delays or drops to the network traffic. The edge distribution this does not require the same performance as in the campus core. Okay, so however, it can require other requirements or features and functionalities that increase the overall cost. Building access layer design considerations. So when implementing the campus infrastructure's building access layer, you have to consider the following questions. Okay. So how many users or host ports are currently required in the wiring closet? And how many will it require in the future? So other question would be, should the switches be fixed or modular configuration? Okay. So next would be, how many ports? Okay, so we're talking about the number of ports. How many ports are available for end users connect? at the walls of the building okay how many access switches are not located in the wiring closets what cabling is currently available in the wiring closet and what cabling options exists for uplink connectivity so others would be what data link layer performance does the node need what level of redundancy is needed okay so we have performance, redundancy, the cabling, all right? So you also have the, what is the required link capacity to the building distribution layer switches, okay? And how will VLANs and STP be deployed? So take note that modern day designs supports VLAN or the virtual LAN. And of course, you also have the spanning tree uh, implementation or deployment. Okay, so will there be a single VLAN or several VLANs per access switch? Or will the VLANs on the switch be unique or spread across multiple switches? Okay, so the latter design was common a few years ago, but today end-to-end -end VLANs, also called as the campus-wide VLANs, are not desirable. Okay, so are additional features such as port security, um, multicast traffic, the quality of service, are this required? Okay, 
Now, based on the answers of those questions, select the devices that satisfies the building access layer requirements. Okay. Now, the building access layer should maintain the simplicity of traditional LAN switching with the support of basic network intelligence services and business applications. Now, what's the key point here? Okay, so the following are the best practice recommendations for optimal building access layer design. Okay, so first, you have to manage VLAN and SDP. Okay, so with that, you have to limit VLANs to a single closet whenever possible. So if STP is required, then it is recommended to use the RPVSD Plus. Next would be, you need to set the trunk to desirable and desirable with negotiate. Okay, so if you want to learn more about VLANs, so you could go ahead and check the supplementary videos. Now, manually prone unused VLANs is also required. And then, use VTP transparent mode. So all of this were covered on our supplementary video. So you could check that out. Next would be manage trunk between switches. Manage default PAGP or the port aggregation protocol settings. Okay. And of course, you have to consider implementing routing in the access layer. Now, for the STP consideration, avoid using STP if possible. Okay, so STP is defined in IEEE 802.1D. Avoid requiring any type of STP or including rapid STP, okay, so or the RSTP by design for most deterministic and highly available network topology that is predictable and bounded and has reliably tuned convergence. So for example, the behavior of layer two environments using STP and layer three environments using a routing protocol are different under soft failure conditions. So when keep alive messages are lost, okay? So in STP environment, if bridge protocol data units or BPDU are lost, the network fails in an open state. For wiring traffic with unknown destinations on all ports, potentially causing broadcast storms. So in contrast, routing environment fail closed, dropping routing neighbor relationships, breaking connectivity, and isolating the soft field devices. So another reason to avoid using STP is for load balancing. If there are two redundant links, STP by default uses only one of these links. Take note. Okay, so while routing protocols by default uses both. All right. So what if STP is required? Okay. So if STP is required, then use RSTP with per VLAN spanning tree plus okay now if you are using cisco devices the cisco rpvst plus implementation is far superior to 802.1 the stp and even the pbsd plus that is we're talking about the convergence perspective okay so it greatly improves the performance okay, or the convergent times for any vlan on which a link comes up and it greatly improves the convergence time compared to backbone fast. Okay. Now, another thing is you might want to consider the spanning tree toolkit or the Cisco STP toolkit. Okay. So those were mentioned in the previous video. You still remember the term like port fast. Okay. Under port fast, you've got a BPDU guard, BPDU filtering. Okay. Uplink fast, backbone fast. STP loop guard, root guard. You've got the PBDU skew detection, and of course the UDLD or the unidirectional link detection. Now for those Cisco STP toolkit, okay, so you've got port fast. So bypass listening learning, okay, so for access port. So uplink fast, three to five seconds convergence after link failure. Back on fast. Cuts convergence by maximum age 
for indirect failure. So some of this are not anymore supported. Okay. So but then port pass, okay, loop guard, root guard, those are still active. Okay. Now for the loop guard, it prevents alternate or root port from becoming a designated in the absence of the PPD use. Now root guard prevents external switches from becoming a root. And BPDU guard, it disables the port fast enabled port if BPDU is received. So if you want to learn more about this Cisco STP toolkit, again, try to visit our supplementary videos. Trunk considerations. So managing trunks between switches. So trunks are typically deployed on the interconnection between the building access and the building distribution layers. So there are several best practices to implement with regard to trunking. Okay. So you have to consider the trunk mode and encapsulation. So as a best practice, when configuring trunks, set the dynamic trunking protocol or DTP to desirable on one side and of course desirable on the other end. So with that is a negotiation option. So one side would be on desirable. Okay. So to have the negotiation between the switch. Okay. So you could also set the pruning okay, or manually pruning VLANs. Another best practice is to manually prune unused VLANs from trunk interfaces to avoid broadcast propagation. So Cisco recommends not using automatic VLAN pruning. Manual pruning provides stricter control. So as mentioned, the campus-wide or access layer-wide VLANs are no longer recommended. So VLAN pruning is less of an issue than it is used to be. Next would be the VTP transparent mode. So VTP transparent mode should be used as best practice because hierarchical network have a little need for a shared common VLAN database. So using VTP transparent mode decreases the potential for operational errors. Okay. Next would be trunking on ports. So trunking should be disabled on ports to which hosts will be attached so that host devices do not need to negotiate trunk status. So this best practice, okay, it speeds up the port pass and is a security measure to prevent VLAN hopping. Layer 3 access to distribution interconnection, okay. So take note from the hierarchy, you've got the access. This is where the users are connected to. And then of course you have distribution devices. So although it is not widely deployed in the building access layer, a routing protocol such as uh, EIGRP or OSPF when properly tuned can achieve better convergence results than layer two and layer three boundary hierarchical design that relies on STP. Okay. Now, however, Adding routing does not result in some additional complexities, including uplink IP addressing and subnetting and loss of flexibility. Okay. Now this figure here illustrates a sample network with layer three routing. Okay. And that is basically on both the access and the distribution layer. Okay. Now in this figure, Equal cost layer 3 load balancing is performed on all links, although EIGRP could perform an equal cost load balancing. So STP is not running and a first half redundancy protocol such as HSRP or the hot standby router protocol is not required. So VLAN cannot uh, span across the multi-layer switch so no VLAN spanning is possible building distribution layer design consideration now the building distribution layer aggregates the building access 
okay? Segment work groups and isolate segments from failures and broadcast storms. So this layer implements many policies based on the access lists and quality of service settings. So the building distribution layer can protect the campus core network from any impact of building access layer problems by implementing all the organization's policies. So when implementing organization policies, okay, so the building distribution layer consider uh, the following questions. So something like, how many devices will each building distribution switch handle? So other questions, uh, what type and level of redundancy are required? How many uplinks are needed? What speed do the uplinks need to be to the building core switches? What cabling is currently available in the wiring closet? And what cabling options exist for uplink connectivity? Okay, so as network services are introduced, it can, the net, uh, it can continue to deliver high performance. Okay, so for all its applications, such as a video on demand, IP multicast or IP telephony. So the network designer must pay special attention to the following network characteristics here. So first is of course, performance. So building distribution switches should provide a wire speed performance on all ports. So this feature is important because of the building access layer aggregation on one side and high speed connectivity to the campus core module on the other side. So future expansions with additional ports or modules can result in an overloaded switch if it is not selected properly. So another consideration would be the redundancy. Okay, Redundancy or redundant building distribution layer switches and redundant connections to the campus core should be implemented. So using equal cost redundant connections to the core supports fast convergence and avoids routing black holes. So network bandwidth and capacity should be engineered to withstand node or link failure. And the last one would be the infrastructure services. So building distribution switches should not only support fast multi-layer switching, but also incorporate network services such as high availability quality of service, security, and policy enforcement. So expanding and or uh, reconfiguring distribution layer devices must be easy and efficient. So these devices must support the required management feature. Overview of recommended uh, practices for building distribution layer. So the key point here is the following are the best practice recommendations for optimal building distribution layer design. So first, you have to use the first half redundancy protocol. Okay, so it's either you use the HSRP, GLBP, or the VRRP. Next would be deploy a layer three routing protocols between the building distribution switches and campus core switches. Okay, and last would be if required, connect the distribution switches. Okay. So um, that is, it should be connected to support layer two VLAN spanning multiple access switches. Okay. So if required, building distribution switches should support VLANs that span multiple building access layer switches. So using the first half redundancy protocol. So if layer two is used between the building access and the building distribution switches, convergence time when a link or node fails depends on the default gateway redundancy and failover time. Okay. So building distribution switches typically provide high or the first half redundancy, which is the default gateway redundancy using either HSRP. Okay. Or you also have the GLBP or the Gateway Load Balancing Protocol and VRRP or the Virtual Router Redundancy Protocol. 
So this redundancy allows the network to recover from the failure of the device acting as the default gateway for end nodes on a physical segment. Okay. So uplink tracking should also be implemented with a first half redundancy protocol. So basically, HSRP, VRRP, and GLBP, all of those are classified to be the first half redundancy protocol. Okay. So HSRP or GLBP timers can reliably tuned to achieve a sub-second 800 to 900 milliseconds. So we're talking about convergence for link or node failure in the boundary between layer 2 and layer 3 in the building distribution layer. Now, how about the recommended practices on the use of layer 3 routing protocols? Okay. So deploying a layer three routing protocols between building distribution and campus core switches. So routing protocols between the building distribution switches and the campus core switches support fast deterministic convergence for the distribution layer across redundant things. So convergence based on the up or down state of a point-to-point -point physical link is faster than timer-based non-deterministic convergence. So instead of indirect neighbor or route loss detection using hellos and dead timers, so physical link loss indicates that a path is unusable. So that means all traffic is rerouted to the alternative equal cost. Okay, so um, build redundant triangle. Okay, so what do we mean by this? Redundant triangle, so I'll have this. Okay, so not the square. So for optimum distribution to core layer convergence, build redundant triangle, not squares. That is to take advantage of the equal cost redundant path for the best deterministic convergence. So figure four, okay, our figure model A and figure model B here illustrates the difference. Okay. Now on the left, okay, or on the model A, the multi-layer switches are connected redundantly with a triangle of links that have layer three equal cost paths. Okay. Now, because the links have equal costs, they appear in the routing table and by default will be used for load balancing. So if one of the links or distribution layer devices fails, convergence is extremely fast because the failure is detected in hardware and there is no need for the routing protocol to recalculate a new path. So it just continues to use one of the paths already in its routing table. So in contrast, on this diagram here, okay, model B, only one path is active by default. And link or device failure requires the routing protocol to recalculate a new route to convergence. Layer 3 distribution interconnection. So in Cisco deployments, HSRP is typically used as the default gateway redundancy protocol. So VRRP is an Internet Engineering Task Force or IETF standards based method of providing default gateway redundancy. So if you are using non-Cisco devices, then you could go ahead and use VRRP instead. So more deployments are starting to use the GLBP because it supports load balancing on the uplinks from the access layer to the distribution layer. Okay, as well as the first half redundancy and failure protection. Now on this diagram here, this model supports a recommended layer 3 point-to-point -point interconnection between the distribution and the access switches. So no VLAN span the building access layer switches across the distribution. Okay, So from an STP perspective, both access layer uplinks and forwarding and no STP convergence is required if uplink failure occurs. All right. So the only convergence dependencies are the default gateway and return path route selection across layer three distribution to distribution link. Okay. 
So if layer 3 is used to the building access switch, the default gateway is at the multi-layer building access switch. And a first hop redundancy protocol is not needed. So if you want to learn more about this redundancy, okay, so you could check the supplementary videos. Okay, so topics about uh, FHRP, okay, that includes HSRP, BRRP, GLBP, all under the first half redundancy protocol or the FHRP. So layer two distribution interconnection. So let's have this alternate here, supporting VLANs that span multiple building access layer switches. So in less than optimal design, where VLANs span multiple building, okay, the building distribution switches must be linked by a layer two connection. Or the building access layer switches must be connected via trunks. Okay, so trunks should be enabled only between switches. Okay, now this design is more complex than when the building distribution switches are interconnected with layer 3. Okay, so STP convergence is required if an uplink failure occurs. So again, as shown in this figure, the following are the recommendations for use in this suboptimal design. Okay, so use RP VST Plus as the version of STP. Right, so provide a layer two link between the two building distribution switches. Okay, so that is to avoid unexpected traffic paths and multiple convergence events. So if you choose the load balancing, okay, be sure to place the HSRP between the or the HSRP primary and the PVST plus root on the same building distribution layer to avoid using inter-distribution switch link for transit. Campus core design consideration. So first, low price. Okay, Low price per port and high port density can govern switch choice for wiring closet environments. But high performance wire rate multi-layer switching drives the campus core design so using the campus core switches reduces the number of connections between the building distribution layer switches and simplifies the integration of the server farm and the enterprise edge modules okay now the campus core switches are primarily focused on wire speed forwarding on all the interfaces and are differentiated by the level of performance achieved per port rather than high port densities. So what's the key point here? As recommended practice, deploy a dedicated campus core layer. That is to connect three or more buildings and the enterprise campus. Okay? So campus core switches are typically multi-layer switches or layer three switches. So using a campus core make scaling the network easier for example with the campus core new building distribution switches only need connectivity to the core rather than full mesh connectivity to all other building distribution switches okay How about large campus multi-layer switch backbone design so we're talking about the campus or large campus design here so for large campus, the most flexible and scalable campus core layer consists of dual multi-layer switches as illustrated on this diagram here. Okay, so you've got the reduced multi-layer switch peering or routing adjacencies. So each multi-layer building distribution switch connects to only two multi-layer campus core switches. So using a redundant triangle configuration as shown earlier, this implementation simplifies any to any connectivity between building distribution and campus core switches and is scalable to an arbitrarily large size. It also supports redundancy and load sharing. So next would be 
topology with no spanning tree loops. So no STP activity exists in the campus core or on the building distribution links to the campus core layer. Because all the links are layer tree or routed links, so arbitrary topologies are supported by the routing protocol used in the campus core layer. Because the core is routed, it also provides multicast and broadcast control. So next one would be improved network services support. So multi-layer campus core switches provide better support for intelligent network services than data link layer core switches could support. Okay. Now this design maintains two equal cost paths to every destination network. So thus recovery from any link failure is fast and load sharing is possible. Okay, so resulting to a higher throughput in the campus core layer. So one of the main considerations when using a multi-layer switches in the campus core is switching performance. Okay, multi-layer switching requires more sophisticated devices for high-speed packet routing. So modern layer 3 switches support routing in the hardware, even though the hardware might not support all the features. So if the hardware does not support a selected feature, it must be performed in software. This can dramatically reduce data transfer. Okay, so for example, access list might not be processed in the hardware if they have too many entries, resulting in switch performance degradation. Small and medium campus design options. So a small campus or large branch network might have fewer than 200 devices and network servers and workstations might be connected to the same wiring closet or telecommunication closet. Now, because switches in a small campus network design may not require high end switching performance or much scaling capability in many cases, the campus core and building distribution layers can be combined into a single layer as illustrated on this diagram here. Okay, so this is building access switching. All right, so this design can scale to only few building access layer switches. A low end multi layer switch provides routing services closer to the end user when multiple VLANs exist. So for a very small office, only low end multi layer switch may support the LAN access requirements for the entire office. Okay. So for a medium sized campus with 200 to 1000 end devices, the network infrastructure typically consists of building access layer switches with uplinks to building distribution or campus core multi-layer switches that can support the performance requirements of a medium sized campus network. So if redundancy is required, Redundant multi-layer switches connect to or connected to the building access switches, providing full link redundancy as shown here in the diagram. Okay, so when when one of these devices here goes down, so there is still a connectivity going to your server farm. Edge distribution design. So let's talk about the edge distribution at the campus core. So as mentioned in the previous video, the enterprise edge modules connect to the campus core directly or through an optional edge distribution module. Okay. Now the edge distribution multi-layer switches filter and route traffic into the campus core, aggregate enterprise edge connectivity and provide advanced services. So switching speed is not as important as security in the edge distribution module, which isolates and controls access to devices that are located in the enterprise edge module. For example, servers in an e-commerce okay, or public servers in an internet connectivity module. So these servers are closer to the external users and therefore introduce a higher risk to the internal campus. So to protect the campus core from threats, 
The switches in the edge distribution module must protect the campus from any of the following attacks, okay? Like an authorized access. All connections from the edge distribution module that pass through the campus core must be verified against the user and the user's rights, okay? You also have IP spoofing. So IP spoofing is a hacker technique for impersonating the identity of another user by using that user's IP address. So denial of service or DOS attacks use IP spoofing to generate requests to servers using the stolen IP address as a source. You also have this network reconnaissance. What is reconnaissance? Reconnaissance means discovery. Okay. So the network reconnaissance or discovery sends packets into the network and collects responses from the network devices. So these responses provide basic information about internal network topology. So next would be packet sniffers. So packet sniffers are devices that monitor and capture the traffic in the network and might be used by hackers. So packets belonging to the same broadcast domain are vulnerable to capture by packet sniffers. Okay, especially if the packets are broadcast or multicast. Server placement in a medium-sized network. So within the campus network, servers may be placed locally in the building access or building distribution layer or attached directly to the campus core. Now, centralized servers are typically grouped into a server farm located in the enterprise campus or in a separate data center. Okay? So servers directly attached to building access or building distribution layer switches. So if a server is local to a certain work group, okay, that corresponds to one VLAN and all work group members and the server are attached to the building access layer switch, most of the traffic to the server is local to the work group. So if required, an access list at the building distribution layer switch could hide these servers from the enterprise. So in some mid-sized networks, building level servers that communicate with clients in different VLANs, but that are still within the same physical building can be connected to building distribution layer switches. Okay, so how about servers directly connected to the campus core? Is that possible? Well, you can do that. Okay, so the campus core generally transports traffic quickly without any limitations. So servers in the medium-sized campus can be connected directly to the campus core switches. Okay, so making the servers closer to the users than if the servers were in a server farm as shown here in the figure. Okay, now however, ports are typically limited in the campus core switches. So policy-based control, QoS and access control list or ACL for accessing the servers is implemented in the building distribution layer rather than in the campus core. How about server placement in a large network? Okay, servers in the server farm module. So larger enterprises may have moderate or large server deployments. For enterprises with moderate server requirements, common servers are located in a separate server farm module connected to the campus core using a multi-layer server distribution switches. Okay. Now, because of a high traffic load, the servers are usually gigabit ethernet attached to the server farm switches. So access list on the server farm module, okay, so implements the controlled access to the servers. So redundant distribution switches in the server farm module and solutions such as the HSRP or GLBP provides fast failover. So the server farm module distribution switches also keep all the server 
to server traffic of the campus core. All right, so how about the server farm design guidelines? Okay, so as shown here in the figure, the server farm can be implemented as high capacity building block attached to the campus core. So again, you have redundancy of connectivity there. Okay. Now, one of the main concerns with the server farm module is that it receives the majority of the traffic from the entire campus. So random frame drops can result because the uplink ports on the switches are frequently oversubscribed. Okay. So when say switch over subscription, it occurs when a switch allows more ports or bandwidth in the chassis than switch hardware can transfer through its internal structure. All right. So to guarantee that no random frame drops occur for business critical applications, the network designer should apply the quality of service mechanisms. Okay. Now next would be the server connectivity options. So servers can be connected in several different ways. For example, a server farm or a server can attach by one or two fast ethernet connections. Okay, so that's dual NIC redundancy. So if the server is dual attached, okay, or dual NIC redundancy, one interface can be active while the other is in hot standby. Now, installing multiple single port NIC or multi port NICs in the servers extends dual home rehoming past the server farm, okay, so to the server itself. So, servers needing redundancy can be connected with dual NIC homing in the access layer or at an NIC that supports Ether channel, okay? Well, several other solutions are available to improve server uh, responsiveness and evenly distribute the load to them. So we call it load balancing, right? So that is, we have to use, okay, so our redundant link also to move the data from the source to destination, not just using it for backups. Now to summarize the enterprise campus design, Design an enterprise campus network using recommended practices. So use low price per port and high port density on data link layer switches for building the access layer. Use redundant multi-layer switching in the building distribution layer for high availability and performance. Use high performance wire rate multi-layer switching in the campus core design and group centralized servers into server farm module for moderate enterprise server requirements.